Uh, welcome to this uh, Wheeler Centre Talking Point. I'm Jonathan Green. I edit the, the Drum at ABC Online. That's abc.net.au slash the drum. Other people can spruit their products later in the evening. Um, we're here to talk at an event somewhat inauspiciously titled Gagging for Freedom. Um, and it deals with a few talking points lately and just in, in, in very recent time there's been the most e egregious erosion of uh, individual liberty that it's been my unfortunate recollection to, to encounter and then this is of course the instance in which uh, Clarence House has deprived the chaser of the uh, chance to call the royal wedding. Just kidding, there is another one of course which is somewhat more serious and which has given uh, a lot of writers and, and the commentariat around Australia the chance to say of Andrew Bolt, you are a vile and bilious wretch but I defend your right to be just that in print. Uh, this of course is the Bolt case which is currently um, under consideration in the federal court um, pending judgment um, that's going to I think form the backbone of our discussion this evening. Um, it's a really polarising uh, instance I think and one which, which pit <clears throat> pits someone's right to be objectionable uh, against the alternative need uh, as a lot of people have expressed it for um, freedom of speech in our culture. So we have three panellists here to mull this over this evening. My left, Bernard Keane. Uh, Bernard is Crikey's Canberra correspondent. He writes on politics, media and business. And previously he's been a public servant, beginning with stints in transport policy as a speechwriter before he moved into communications policy, where he obtained extensive experience in Australian media regulation. He can also share Helen Coonan's hair care tips. Mm. And they're very long. Thank you. Uh, Leslie Catold is in the middle. Leslie is an author, commentator, ethicist and activist and her books include the award-winning The Abortion Myth and What No Baby, which made the Australian Financial Review's top 101 books list. Her first novel, now in its second fabulous edition, The Book of Rachel, was published in 2011 by text. In 2005, she was listed alongside Professor Peter Singer, Professor Gustav Nozzle and Inga Clendenning as one of Australia's top 20 public intellectuals and in 2011 she was made Australian Humanist of the Year. Professor James Allen to her left uh, is a Garrick Professor of Law at the University of Queensland. He's a native born Canadian who practiced law with a large firm in Toronto uh, and at the bar in London. He's taught in Hong Kong, New Zealand and Canada before moving to Australia in 2005. He's published in all the top English language, legal, philosophy and constitutional law journals and has a new book coming out next month entitled The Vantage of Law. Uh, Jim is a Bill of Rights sceptic and I'm sure we'll come to that later uh, and is delighted that Australia does not have one of these insidious instruments. And I'd like to start with you Jim and using um, the, the Bolt case and its um, racial vilification Act, which is sort of the core of that, but perhaps draw us a bit of a, uh, a mud map of where freedom of speech sits in Australia. Is it in any way guaranteed? And well, I mean, I've, my line since I got here six years ago has always been that in terms of what you can say, your scope to speak your, your mind in Australia, it's, it's probably, it's certainly more than in Canada. Canada has one of the strongest bills of rights in the world, but it's, you can certainly have more scope to speak your mind here. So in terms of making some sort of amorphous generalization, like, are you in favor of the right to free speech? Well, everyone says yes. Right, but when you start asking specific questions like, where do you want to draw the line in hate speech? Where do you want to draw the line when it comes to campaign finance rules and you know billionaires spending their own money to sway elections or defamation regimes? There is more scope for people in Australia to, in effect, express their opinions than there is in Canada, the UK, New Zealand. The Americans have very strong free speech protections in form, but you know, I've spent a semester at an American at Cornell Law School, and the amount of self-censorship in the U.S. is phenomenal. So, at least until this Bolt trial, I, I've always said that Australia has great free speech protection. I'm a big free speech person, so there's no necessary connection between supporting a Bill of Rights. I don't, and valuing free speech. I do, and uh, to me, the test for free speech is when you protect the rights of people whose views you don't like. I mean, everyone's in favor of the kind of views where you sit around, you hold hands, you sing kumbaya, and nobody's offending anyone. It's worthless having free speech. The They're, Racial Vilification Act, under which okay, the so bulk, there was an the amendment in the mid-90s. But is that is that a, a step too 
if uh, is I don't like it. It's, it's, it's egregious legislation. It's appalling. Um, what it effectively says is that, uh, well, what it does is it undermines the idea of equality before the law so that you then build up this sort of group rights mentality and you're not really empowering minorities, you're empowering the state or petty bureaucrats or people who administer these laws. If I can give an example in Canada, um, there was a stand-up comedian, Guy Earle. Now everyone knows about the Mark Stein stuff, so I won't mention that. So I'll go with something people probably don't know about Guy Earle. Uh, he was a stand-up comedian making $50 a night for the bar tab, and he was being heckled. Comedians get heckled, and there was two women, and they just kept heckling him, so he, he made some remarks related to them being lesbians. Uh, three years later, he gets brought before a, a, a court sort of type setup where the people who make the complaint don't have to pay any of their own costs, the state does, which is a you know a characteristic of the Canadian one. And he's just been fined $15,000, which he can't pay because he's got no money. Um, you know, he can't believe what's happened to him. And you think, gee, if you want to live in a democratic city, you really have to have a bit of a thick skin. You really have to be able to, you know, I mean, there's no right not to be offended in a democracy. That, I mean, that's point of offence, Bernard, if I can go to you, because you wrote a, a, a fairly prominent and, for some people, surprising uh, defence of Bolt, sort of early in this public discussion. Um, and uh, elements of that, sort of the right to be offended, but also what happens when an instance like this gets into a court and the court process takes over, it's necessarily adversarial. Um, and um, you, you made points about, for example, Merkel's uh, prosecution of Bolt, which the whole thing sort of takes on a, a, another level. I mean, why, why did you feel on the back of, of, of Merkel's prosecution in particular and in the Bolt case that you there's, just there's stick lot, up for it? Yeah, there's, there's a lot there. The, the, the point about Merkel was that the, the merits of the case aside, and, I, and, and being a non-lawyer, I don't have a, a particular view about the, about the merits of the case that was brought against Andrew Bolt or, or for that matter, his, his defence. But the, 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 the opening statement by, by um, a former federal court judge, Ron Merkel, was, was quite remarkable. I mean, he... he it was it was Godwin's law, sort of, you know, writ large. In, in came explain in, in, Godwin's law well, for the, the, you know, the, the the old internet meme that uh, that uh, meme. There's the, the there's another word you don't we like. Explain, yes, yeah. um, the, the the idea that as soon as you invoke the Nazis, that's the, there goes your argument. You've you, you've lost it. And I mean, right from the get go, in came Nuremberg in in Merkel's uh, uh, opening statement and, and references to eugenics. I mean, a pretty clear attempt to really well. It was it was less. It was more than implied. It was pretty direct link between what Andrew Bolt was saying in his highly offensive and, and inaccurate, uh, worse than inaccurate, plain wrong um, uh, pieces, and you know, genocide, uh, in a word. So the, the, the nature of Merkel's opening address, I think, was really took the case, um, whatever its merits, to, to, um, to a rather different level. I mean, the other sort of elements at, at, at work here, I mean, the concept of what we're talking about in the RDA is in, in 18C and 18D, for that matter, the, the exemption to 18C, what we're talking about is a very subjective test about offence, mm. and 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 it is, it's framed in a way that's designed to appear objective. It talks about a reasonable person thinking that something may be offensive uh, on racial uh, etc. grounds, and the exemption even is is cast in in those terms, but it's still fundamentally. Um, uh, subjective. It's about um, the idea. The, one of the exemptions is if someone's actually written it in the course of, of you know, fair comment. Um, actually, sort of. I think I can't remember the exact words, but it's along the lines of if someone sort of legitimately believes what they're saying, then they're somehow exempted from it. I'm, I'm probably slightly mis 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 misrepresenting. It's about good and that, 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 that they're two innately subjective tests, and that seems to me is, is enormously problematic because something like discrimination. There's at least a sense in which you can objectively assess whether there's been a whether, whether, whether someone has not missed their position on their merits, or but the idea of offence it seems to me brings in a wholly uh, subjective issue. But Leslie, I mean, is there on that thing of offence? Is there a way in which we could have? I mean, surely that's what something like the Racial Vilification Act is getting at: is that sort of notion of, of being offended by what you have done or said. I mean, is there a, is there a, a need for you know, defending, people's, uh, defending people from offence or should we protect the right to be offended? 
I don't think that's entirely, and again, I'm not a lawyer either, so in some ways I guess... I'm not a climate scientist, but... (laughs) So I guess kind of where I come at this from is a position of um, trying to have looked at all the arguments. So one of the main arguments, there are a couple of arguments that are being made. One is that, you know, either you have um, this situation where we're, you know, just prosecuting people on the subjective notion that other people are offended by what they say and free speech is finished completely, um, or we have completely untrammeled, um, no restrictions on people's capacity to have free speech. And yet, I understand, and I understand from a moral point of view, and I understand from a legal point of view, that we do restrict free speech. So you can't perjure, you can't um, yell fire in a crowded movie house, you can't defame. So the question to me in this case seems to be, is the Racial Discrimination Act something that adds another um, restriction? Is it reasonable? Are we in a position yet to assess whether or not it's reasonable? So the cases that were cited here, that's not what's happened in Australia. By and large, this this legislation has lain largely dormant. And what do you think on the basis of the, the Bolt prosecution? Is that a reasonable...? Well, I think, again, you know, just coming at it from um, somebody who, who lives in Melbourne, and, and probably most of us here do, um, my view of it really is that Andrew Bolt um, is a very problematic character. And he's, I'm not going to say he's a problematic character the way that people normally do, because normally the fact that they don't like him is because they don't like the content of what he says. And that's not my problem with him. I like the fact that there are people who disagree with me. Um, I grew up, you know, I basically kind of was raised professionally in a, in a philosophy department. That's what you do. You argue with people and it's no fun to argue with someone who agrees with you. So I don't have a problem with him disagreeing with me. I have a problem with the way he goes about practicing journalism. And so from my point of view, he um, brings the, prof- the profession that I'm peripherally engaged with as a columnist into disrepute because of the way that he practices. And I think the fundamental problem with Bolt and the reason why this case was brought was because instead of him being treated like someone who does not behave professionally, who does not report accurately, who abuses power, does not act in good faith, blah, 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 has been that he has been promoted, accelerated, put on television, and he keeps getting higher and higher and having more and more of a voice. And I so, think the so people who brought the case were trying to stop him. Maybe we should have laws for bad jewelers, too. You know, well, bad jewelers and it's, bad chair makers. And, and it you know, it's, it's ridiculous issue. to characterize this as he's not a very good journalist. I mean, but that's sure, not what's going on. They're not saying you're not a very good journalist, so we're no, going to take I'm, you to court. I think, in fact, if I understood it correctly, they indeed were. So one of the claims was, was that he factually made mistakes, many, many factual mistakes, calling black, white, calling certain people Aboriginal when they weren't, he made those mistakes and they were easily defamation. Can we, can we, and, without and getting onto probably. defamation, can we differentiate on an, in an issue of freedom of speech between an individual in the street, perhaps you know, on their own, using no, no more than the power of their voice, saying something which is objectionable, and somebody like Bolt or any other you know, media operator who has the extraordinary access to you know, expanded audience that their work gives them. Are there different rules that should apply in those situations? This is a variant of an argument that's been raised, which is, you know, it's fine for, um, you know, it was an argument directed to me, it's fine for smug white middle class people with access to a media outlet to talk about free speech. It's even finer for Andrew Bolt, who's got the power of the world's most powerful media corporation, mm. behind him to talk about free speech. But ultimately, free speech is, in a sense, a construct. It is because it's about access to the courts. And whether you can take someone to court, whether you've got the resources to, to defend yourself, it's an innately sort of artificial right that, that is used by elites as part of their sort of general system of whatever they do, whether it's repression or, or simply preserving their own power. And, and there's a lot of validity to that. I mean, the, the, the idea of free speech is innately one that's bound up with the law, and therefore it's bound up with access to courts, and therefore it is one that privileges um, the elites, and that's always going to be the way. That doesn't necessarily seem to me to therefore logically justify the idea that um, that there is somehow a different rule in terms of the application of free speech, that, that if you reduce Andrew Bolt's right to free speech or News Limited's right to free speech, that somehow you're um, fixing some other problem up in society. You're, you're fixing up other people's lack of access to free speech or lack of access to the tools by which you defend free speech, which is, of course, the courts. I don't think by reducing his rights or curtailing his freedoms that somehow you, uh, that you achieve anything else 
in society that's positive. It's probably just worth inserting a few factual things here. That, um, I, I was speaking to someone who was relatively close to the case, um, and as I understand what they told me, um, there was a collective view involved in this case, and again, I think this goes to issues about power. So there were some people who were advised that they could have successfully sued Andrew Bolt for defamation, and they were told by their lawyers that would have been the case. I'm not a lawyer independently. I can't verify that that's true, but that's what they were told. But instead, because some people in the group were not going to be able to do that, a decision was made collectively to take this case using the RDA. Because my primary question about it was a question I think lots of people had, which is why didn't the people who had been you know, um, defamed and factual information uh, about them misrepresented, why didn't they just sue under existing defamation laws as opposed to trying to kind of test this other provision that we have that really hasn't been developed? That was the reason. And again, I do think this cuts to issues about power and motivation. So it is interesting to know, I was interested to know, that part of the motivation was very much this sense that Andrew Bolt um, is somebody who does not ever answer in a moral sense, in a professional sense, or in a legal sense for what he does. And that what he does is not fair play, it's abusive of power, it takes people who are tiny and small and not able to defend themselves and rips them up and eats them for breakfast. This, I mean, this is where the interesting it, point about media and individual comes in because what, what he does, and I mean, we shouldn't make this specifically, I don't think, about him. He represents a, a broader principle. Well, he's a perfect case <laughs> he said, for it, though. He said somewhat <laughs> cautiously about the blowback. Hands up who does what this to be all about, Andrew, by the way. Excellent. Oh, so can, can, I just, can I just respond to that? Because with all due respect to Leslie and her friends who are assuring her secondhand about the shit, he, there was no... You're actually hang close on, to the case. doesn't so matter. It's a, it's a There's no hope source. to sue in defamation here. Even if he couldn't use truth as the defense, and even if he couldn't use fair comment as defense, the implied rights cases from the early 1990s, would have, he, he would not, they would not have succeeded it's, in defamation. It's a, it's a bit of a red herring anyway, because clearly, clearly they decided that was not going to be the course if, they if pursued. If they could have sued in defamation, believe me, they would have. Is it not they more, don't get anything. But, 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 they but, get but, very little money this way. They get no money. They, They're they, not they, suing they, for money. But they can get money. First they want an but apology, which out. is Orwellian. They've ruled, they've ruled, out ruled it out because they know they're going to lose. Look, let me, let, let's recharacterize the argument a bit. Yeah, let, let's say this. If you think that you have, you have some recourse because you're offended, I am willing to bet that everyone in the audience thinks it would be ridiculous in the U.S., right, if, they, if, you, if you could get in trouble for, for burning the American flag. Now, believe me, there are a lot of Americans who get really offended at the thought of burning the flag. Or a Quran, for example. Or the Quran. Now, most people think, hey, it's good that in the U.S., you're legally entitled as a, uh, you're legally entitled to burn the flag, but we know there's lots of people in good faith who are offended. So if you're if you want to set up a legal regime where you can you can bring court action against people because they're offended, which, which at the heart this is, people are offended. If they don't like what Bolt said, they should say. I mean, one of these women is a law professor from Sydney. It's not a power imbalance. She's articulate. She's got lots of access to the media. She could just say, look, I might have one sixteenth Aboriginal blood. Or whatever, but here's why you're wrong, Andrew Bolt. But she didn't do that. Now, the minute you go down that, you're, you're leaving John Stuart Mill and the idea that in the end, the best defense against dumb ideas is truth and speaking your mind. You're moving into a regime where there's petty little bureaucrats are going to decide these things. You're not empowering minorities. You're empowering bureaucrats and second-rate government officials. Is there, is there anyone it's here who would, do, 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 we, do we defend the, the, the RDA here? I mean, is it, does it have a valid role in this? Well, again, I think what's, what is interesting is that we so want to preempt. First of all, we want to attack people who are using a law that exists. If you don't like the law, argue for it to be repealed. I have. It the should law, go. Okay, it should but go. But the law exists, and therefore people who use it should not well, be condemned. Well, we could get five lawyers to sit it on the panel and just talk about the law, but we're talking about principle. You've brought up moral principles six times. It would be that's my area. Well, fine. So we don't talk about law then. I thought we were talking it principle. Interesting. It would be interesting to, to know what I think could happen in this case. So in other words, it doesn't seem to me to be that wise to preempt what the court might decide. Now, it may turn out, usually there's a back and forth with this sort of thing. Whoa, like, like the microphone. Um, there's a back and forth. So it may be that the law overextends itself. It may be that things go too far. And then usually things are drawn back. But it, it, the question really, in essence, is do we want to try to use the law to achieve some sort of accommodation between the untrammeled rights of free speech, often of very powerful people who have lots of platforms, and 
the other needs in society because, of course, no rights are unlimited. All rights have limits and they need to be balanced against other rights. So the other needs of people. Now, offence has continually been brought up that the problem here is people are simply offended. And we all get offended about things. I get offended about things too. But I'm not really quite clear that that covers the nugget of what's going on here. So one of the things that has been, one of the cases that has been brought under the RDA has been about Holocaust denial. And the questions that were raised in that um, case, and again, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm really going off of my understanding that comes from the law report, in fact, which you can look up as well. Um, but my understanding of what that case was saying was that it wasn't an argument about facts. So it wasn't the fact that the denier was saying, oh, the Holocaust never happened, um, your grandmother really didn't die in an oven, which indeed is an extremely offensive thing for somebody whose grandmother died in an oven to hear. But the problem really was that they were suggesting that the Holocaust was itself a hoax. It was a hoax perpetuated by a people, the Jewish people, on the rest of the world. And that that is something that, of course, vilifies the Jewish people and concretely can and does lead to anti-Semitism. How, how is it possible? Know, to frame protections that would prevent, you know, people giving, you know, such a, a, an obnoxious point of view. And what's, and what's the difference between a mere offence mm. and vilification? Because, I mean, I, the, 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 the case of, of Frederick Tobin, who's been prosecuted for Holocaust denial, I think is another case of someone articulating extraordinarily offensive views, but still primarily offensive and therefore in not in any way directly harmful. But again, I guess what was interesting about it was that they were saying, well, the Act specifically protects people and, um, from if it was an academic debate. So if what Tobin had been saying was, no, look, you know, it's not, it's not 30,000, it's 60,000 or it's not 6 million, it's 2 million, that kind of academic debate is expressly allowed. Which, it which was, that wasn't at all. That was it, mere it, Holocaust it, denial. It was right the now. contention about the hoax. Mm. So the denial was connected to the notion of the hoax and the hoax was the bit that vilified an entire people and of course like notions of defamation brought them into disrepute and of course we know there's concrete outcomes for people of discrimination so your question is how could we frame the law again I guess you know I take a much more open mind and a less disastrous oh my god the sky's falling in view of this case this case is is working the way the law should the law has been passed somebody has brought a case we had a decision that shaped the law a bit we now have another case it will shape the law again. If it goes too far and all of a sudden it's terrible because Andrew Bolt, you know, doesn't get to say in a substantive way what he wants to say. And for me, there is a difference between Andrew Bolt being able to, to make his substantive points, whether I like them or I don't, and the way he goes about it. And I would like to see him restricted from the way he goes but about ha, but, it. But how often? But how, well, can I actually, the law provide that? Maybe. And why shouldn't it if, we, if it can? But how often, does, how often does the balance swing back in the last 10 years, ever since 9-11 and, and governments began a systematic sort of uh, contraction of our basic rights, how often does the pendulum swing back? How often do, do governments in particular, it might be slightly different with courts, mm. but how often do governments say, oh, look, we've gone too far, we're going to pull back on the abrogation of people's rights? It just doesn't, in the last 10 years, it just hasn't happened. We've just seen a constant creep of legislation intruding into our basic rights. I don't see... Um, I, I can't see, I can't, don't think it's realistic to say, look, if this the judgment goes too far, that there's going to be some sort of rowback from our legislators, because ultimately it's going to be because uh, it's, it's legislatively based, this isn't activist judges, there may be activist judges implementing it and interpreting it, but there's still the basic idea there of uh, if you offend someone, then uh, there are circumstances in which you can face a civil penalty. I think it's a good point. And actually, for me, that point would, would go towards the idea that what we should have been doing in this last 15 years is arguing for the repeal of this act, as opposed to now that somebody has used a law that's a legitimate law to suggest that somehow they ought not to have used it. And yet, I, I mean, the advocates of free speech would suggest even more framework. And, and, and a lot of people would talk about Bill of Rights as some sort of a guarantee. It's not. Of, well, I was going to go to you here, because how, how does... Look, how I, does... I have an objection to the way Leslie characterises her argument. Leave aside the fact she says, I'm on the side of open-mindedness, which, you know, of course, everyone wants to be on the side of open mind I think I'm more open-minded than she is. She thinks she's more open-minded than I am. This isn't about you You too, cannot you know. seriously say that, you cannot seriously say that any time a law is passed by the legislature, therefore, okay, we have to give it a go. You can't say it's a bad law. It's a bad law from the minute it was passed in 1995. And the fact that, uh, you know, someone's trying to implement it. It, it just seems to me uh, a very. A, I'm trying to test it. That well, was so all I said. It's a, it's, it's, I mean, it, but isn't, isn't, all that, sorts the, of bad isn't that the legal happen. process of, of bad laws? Is that they will be tested? They will be. Well, sure, you know, but there's two things going on here. You could say, on the one hand, what do we think about this case in principle? Do we like it? And the other thing we could say is, 
as a bunch of lawyers sitting around reading Section 18D and the exemptions, what do we think the judge is going to do? And there's a chance that Bolt could win. I, it's a toss-up. It's bad legislation, though. It, 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 both sides have spent about a million and a half dollars. How many people are in the audience are going to be prepared to say stuff thinking, God, even if I win, I'm out of pocket a million and a half? You know, it's a very chilling effect here. I think it's I would a take very it. chilling effect, and it limits what people can say. Talk, talk to me on that Bill of Rights point, because I think that's an interesting thing, because that's where people reflexively turn here in the face of this sort of nitty-bitty I mean, legislation. Because people in Victoria are saddled with a terrible charter of rights, so they, they might, you know, and I've I said that provocatively, but look, all a Bill of Rights does is list eight or nine moral abstractions that everyone's in favor of. Right to free speech, right to freedom of religion, right to freedom of association, no unreasonable search and seizure. Things that are framed in such abstractions that everyone's in favor. You know, I used to debate George Williams around the country on bills of rights, and I'd start by saying, who's against the right to free speech? That guy Tobin was in the audience once in Adelaide. Even he put up his hand. You know, I'm waiting for a guy in a little brown shirt and a mustache to say he's against it. Everyone's in favor of the right to free speech in the abstract. But when you start asking people the kinds of questions that get to court, we look at every single decision that's come to the top courts in Canada and the US, they are all highly debatable. Where do we draw the line on hate speech? People don't agree. Where do we draw the line on campaign finance rules? People don't agree. These are the kinds of questions that free speech provokes. And all a Bill of Rights does is, instead of the elected politicians drawing the lines, the judges do. Now, unless you happen to think that a law degree in 10 years practice at the bar gives you greater moral perspicacity, maybe Leslie thinks that, I don't, um, you know, a Bill of Rights doesn't protect anything. As I said, Canada has a very strong Bill of Rights and less free speech than Australia. Bernard, do you have a Bill of Rights view? Yeah, I, I don't like the idea of a Bill of Rights. I, I, don't, I have no problem with the idea of a Bill of Rights, which is, I don't forget the, the technical name for it, but one way, basically, it's a tool to assess uh, new legislation, um, and you can actually sort of test it against new legislation, and there may need to be a, you know, God help us, yet another impact statement about why a particular new piece of legislation doesn't meet the, the, the requirements of a, of, a, of a Bill of Rights. But a, but a more um, aggressive activist Bill of Rights that uh, indeed moves the task of protecting rights from elected officials to unelected officials, it seems to me, is uh, intensely problematic. And it, outsour it, it outsources the democratic role and it seems to me that a lot of people who advocate Bill of Rights do so because they just don't like the governments that they've got. And they think the governments that they've got or the parliaments that they've got are, um, uh, are not up to the task of, of, um, of protecting people's rights. And yet the and, parliaments, the governments and parliaments that we have are, are capable of legislation like the Racial Discrimination Act, which gets us into this. Well, and, and the ultimate answer to that is we'll look elect a better parliament, elect better politicians, don't outsource the role... Or repeal the legislation. To, to, um, to, ..to the judges. But the politicians pass this legislation. I mean, you can't run it both ways. Like, the politicians pass the Racial Discrimination Act. If we didn't like it, we need to lobby them. We can't say, on the one hand, you know, we don't need courts. I mean, every No one every says you don't need courts. OK, but every part of the process has a role. Now, I'll tell you a story about Bill of Rights from Canada. Bill of Rights in Canada, um, this horrible instrument, actually enabled very repressive abortion abortion laws to be struck down and they've never been um, brought back. And so as a consequence, women in Canada actually have um, free access to abortion. It's no longer in the criminal but, but what code. If, what if, what but if it was used just, to strike down? I guess all I was going to say about that, all I was going to say about that was that this is a question of power, and I don't find it surprising that certain people find it difficult to understand not sitting in the most powerful place in the room, not sitting in that 40 to 50-year-old white male seat. But, but not I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't does. nominated with and Peter so Singer as one of the top Australians in you know, the 2005. I'm Come on, not you're, not, you're not a victim. And I'm not claiming to be one. You're not a victim. No. And a professor of law, and a professor of law in Sydney is not a victim. Between she themselves. is not a victim. I it's going to be okay. Them. Well, so everyone, not everyone sees myself, themselves as I'm morally the superior. But can we, can we, can we, can we leave, leave the, leave I'm the personal? On the podium. So all I was going to say when I was so rudely interrupted. Well, what do you think of Best Price? Do you think about, she's a victim? Was about power, which is in play here. And it's in play in issues around the Racial and Discrimination it's, uh, which, Act. Which is, I think, really, in, in the specific case of Bolt, the power thing is really interesting because uh, if, there, if there were a better framework for disciplining his profession... I was just uh, going to say ..then that, I actually. think we would not have we got into this here. situation. If, if someone like him, with the access to the, the, the media channels that he has access to, was held more to account in terms of accuracy and fairness and all the like, things that we would like to see in journalism... Not earnestly promoted him. But, but the fact is that he is, is encouraged by his professional setting to be as extreme as he is, and, and that, I think, is, is, is 
surely an issue? I mean, Bernard, is that as, as a journalist? I mean, is absolutely. A... And, and one of, the, one of the, the, the few good things that come out of the case is that he's been forced on the stand to admit that he got basic things wrong. Yep. Now, that's the sort of process that he should be being, well, if not necessarily that sort of you know, highly interrogative, highly expensive process. That is the sort of process that, that a good press council should actually be, be, be running and available for, and one that should actually give confidence to anyone that they can take on you know, the most powerful media company in the world and actually get them to admit that they made fundamental mistakes. That process is almost entirely lacking, um, uh, despite the fact that there is an extant press council there mm-hmm. and, and there are, there's a CEO who wants to, who wants to, wants to beef it up. That, that, you're right that that lack of a process uh, is, is, a, is, a critical, is, a, is a critical failing here. That's not to say that if... if um, um, if, if there was defamation of a particular individual, that, that shouldn't foreclose the idea they should go straight to court, take Andrew Bolton News Limited to court, um, and see if they can uh, get compensation for Hard to win defamation their... actions. Very hard. But did it, did it make you think, though, because the whole thing made me think, that the principle behind, for instance, the, Jew, the Jewish people taking Tobin, um, the principle behind that was the idea that nobody spoke up against the Nazis. Everybody said, you know, don't give the mayor, just ignore them, and, and the Holocaust happened. So the idea behind that now, amongst many in the Jewish community, is you, you jump on anything, you step on every kind of, of, of word, any suggestion, because it can all lead to the Holocaust. So it, it made me wonder whether or not um, my approach to Bolt, and I get mentioned in his columns, so I easily could have had a say in my own columns, but I don't. I, don't, I try not to give him air. I don't read him. Why would I want to read him? I ignore him. And most journalists who I respect and admire ignore him. Why, why would you do other? But it did make me wonder whether or not that was the right approach as to whether or not if we had spoken up, if we really had been concerned about the professional practice of Andrew Bolt, which I have been, we didn't say something and that would have redressed the situation situation because instead of being in the paper every single day and all over the web and on the insiders and now going on to Channel 10, he would just have been like a normal columnist and had one column a week <laughs> and be much more manageable that way and not be so influential. This, this goes a little bit to your point too. I mean, if, if, the, if the case hadn't been brought against Bolt, if he hadn't been built up into this, you know, this is the effect of it. It makes him a martyr for both for free speech and for the point of view that he represents, I guess. Well, I mean, on, the, that... on the principle of it, I think uh, Jewish groups that go after Holocaust deniers are making a mistake. They're turning them into martyrs. Uh, I, was in, I had a summer job in Ontario with the Attorney General, and they went after Zundel, who was a Holocaust denier. He had a magazine that had about 12 subscribers, and after they prosecuted him, went up to about 1,200. It was, it was, it was dumb. Um, I mean, seriously, I think it's, it's a, but this is on the, this is not a, that's not a legal point. I think that's a point of principle. But on, but on Leslie's point about power imbalance, look, I was overseas in the U.S. I've just come back. But, you know, if it's really about power imbalance, my wife watched the Q&A show in which uh, Professor Barrent tweeted about Bessie Price. Now, there's no way that you could say that Bessie Price is not at a power disadvantage to a professor of law at Sydney. And I didn't see the show, but uh, when you read the tweet she made, it was incredibly offensive. I mean, I've never seen a man have sex with a horse, so I don't know how offensive that actually is. But uh, come on, if, if it's really about power imbalance, she should not, she should not be given the job that she was given by this government. It was an incredibly offensive thing. Now, I don't care about offense. I think you've got to have a thick skin and live with it. But you can't say you're in favor of this on a basis of power imbalance. But the minute the person that you're supporting has, you know, stomped on a woman from the middle of Australia. What do we create, though? I mean, and, and there's all sorts of argument around that specific case that's, you know, would, would distract us. But what do we create where we have a total absence of framework, where everybody has the untrammeled right to speak, where there is... Now there's defamation laws. They're very hard to trigger, but you always have defamation laws. You said before, though, it's an extremely hard to... They're hard to trigger, but you want... You want you want it to be hard to limit someone's what, speech. But, but, no, what sort of public discussion do we but, get, though, but, if there's no limit or constraint but, but on it? This is, it's not zero and one. We don't have. No, I don't think. Any, I don't know of anyone who seriously uh, articulates unrestricted freedom of speech. Everyone, I think. Well, everyone I've read or heard of accepts the idea that if your speech, you know, directly harms someone, mm. you know, the proverbial yelling of fire in the theatre, or harming someone's job prospects or, or career. Um, uh, or professional prospects, you can sue them for defamation. But there, there beyond are, there defamation, are, what, what, what remedy do we have other than things like the Race Discrimination Act, which can lead us into well, these, these dry cultures? The, 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 the issue is, do you... And, 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 I, and I accept Leslie's logic on this. I mean, what she's saying, if I, if I can sort of simplify...
simplistic of paraphraser. This is in a way about extending a sort of or trying out a new form of protection in addition to the ones we've already got. It seems to me the big sort of leap that we're making is going from the idea of direct harm, which is you know things like defamation relate to, to a, a different sort of test, which is sort of less direct, it may well be direct, in which case they should have sued for defamation, but is also a much harder to assess test, which is innately subjective. That's the big leap I think we're making. We're moving, offense is a, seems to me a different sort of type of test that we're putting on, how, you know, where do we re restrict free speech? But everyone agrees we restrict free speech in some way. So the, the idea that we so something there's this sort of idea of let's just have untrammeled free speech and just you know if you don't like it lump it. Um, it, it. No one's no one's advocating that. There are rules, and there may have even been rules that could have been used differently uh, in this particular case. But um, um, ultimately, it's not about this sort of this you know alternative where um, you know it's on for young and old and it's the wild west and you can do anything you like. No, you, you can't do that, and no one's suggesting I think that you can. And, and just for argument's sake, because I, to be honest, I know I sound like I'm so definitive about what side I'm on. I'm not really actually sure what I think about any of this, but I just can see that there are arguments on both sides, so I'm taking one. It seems to me like, um, if you look at what the consequence is, so there's been lots of, you know, sky falling in kind of stuff about if, you know, Bolt is, is done, the Herald Sun is done, horror, shock, horror, chilling effect on freedom of speech. Yes, possibly, but if we look at what the consequence is, it's a civil consequence, so it's not criminal. My understanding is that all the kind of claims that they are, any money is ever going to be sought subsequently have been ruled out. They've stopped trying to get an apology from Bolt because as the measure of the man, he won't offer one. So what they're going to get and what they want is is an apology from the paper, and I know that's hard for, for a press to offer, but nonetheless, that's what they want. And they want them to pull down the offensive articles, and they want to try and stop Bolt from doing whatever it is the court delineates was the part of what he did from him, to stop him from doing that again. Now, to me, that's significant. I work as a columnist. I understand that that is significant. But nonetheless, it doesn't stop Andrew Bolt, for instance, talking about who should be considered to be an Aborigine, because that's not the concern that the complainants have. The concern is about how he did that, which is why I keep trying to draw the distinction between the substance of what he said and the formal processes by which he went about arguing it, which I think is really what the problem is here. Jim, you would see those things as, as being agreed well, to? I mean, I, 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 as a practical matter, if you're seeing what matters in this case now, I, when both sides have spent a million and a half dollars on lawyers, if you, everyone knows if you win, in our common law system, you get about two thirds of your cost paid by their side. So all of the concerns Leslie's raised have long since gone out the window. Nobody cares what they get. They just want to win so they get, they don't have to pay the costs. So right now what's sitting over top of this entire case is one of the sides is going to have to pay the lawyer's fees on the other side. It's going to, if, if, if they don't, if Bull wins, the other side's going to be out of, they'll, they'll be bankrupt. And in effect, so I mean, all of this other stuff is now going to, this is the ridiculousness of putting it through the courts. You're bringing in QCs, they're charging huge amounts, even though they're doing it uh, for nothing for, for the people going against Bolt. They're, if they lose, they're going to have to pay Bolt's lawyers and they're going to ask for that money. So when you take a basically a moral issue or a political issue and you turn it into a pseudo legal issue and you drive it through the courts, lawyers don't work for free. And there is a huge amount of money at stake in this case just to pay the people who've run the case. And that's really what it's about now, in my view. All this other stuff is just chicken feed. But in some ways, it's a ridiculous, it, it situa it's a ridiculous situation. In some ways, it underlines, I think, and again, this goes to the source that I spoke to, it underlines whether or not we, you know, it's subjective. So it's completely subjective to say how much they were hurt. It's completely subjective, you know, how, much, how long is a piece of string? But the person who was close to the case was saying they took this case, knowing it could be very expensive, knowing they were likely to lose, they took it collectively because they really, really did feel like the way that they had been treated collectively was unacceptable. But I, don't, I, don't, I find it hard to believe there would be anyone who doesn't agree that, that the material was extraordinarily offensive. The issue is not really this case. The issue is the next case. If 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 this if this if this court case succeeds, then we, 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 who, what's the next sort of basis of offence for racial and religious? And I can't remember uh, the, the full list, but racial. Uh, but it, you know, it's not about hairstyle. It's not about offending someone because of their hair or their clothes. But it, it, you know, it's, it's about important stuff. But but where but where where is the ne where does the next case end up? Is it will it be so clear cut, or will it be, will it be one where we think, oh, hang on, 
you know, there's an issue here. And once the precedent is established, and, and I think one of the issues that we haven't explored that, that, that Jim might want to talk about is the fact that there are so few cases on this particular section of the RDA. I think a, so, I think a board so loses, so he'll, he'll appeal. And it'll, he'll appeal until they get to the high court and they bring in the, the implied right to freedom of political communication, and he'll win. And then you're, and then the people will not just be out a million dollars, they'll be out, they'll lose costs right down the line. They'll be out $8 million or whatever. It'll be so expensive. They, I mean, they're almost better off to lose now. But freedom of but speech will be the winner in this will or not? Well, yeah. I mean, in a sense, I mean, I, I, I don't have sympathy for people who, who feel that the appropriate response to someone saying things that really hit them at the core is to take them to court. The appropriate response is to grow a thick skin and to come out swinging. That's the basis. Come out swinging how? Well, with, with a response, a verbal, strong response. Which, in, in, in making that response, they would have uh, access to, you know, three sin- well, national Well, I know, the, I know a professor at to... Sydney Law School has access to it. I mean, come on. They, they weren't, they're not all, it's not all power imbalance but, but, with some the, of these the people. The imbalance exists in, in this mechanism as well because, I mean, New Zealand has got very, very deep pockets on it, as Jim says. They can appeal all the way to the high court. So the power imbalance, whenever there are courts involved, there's going to be a, the power imbalance, the elites. It's, it's not a it's going to be a, a, an unlevel playing field in favour of the elites, no matter how much, no matter how you cut it. Uh, in whether, every whether, country whether in, in the, the world. The whole point about the fact that you know where is it going to go next? In some ways, the fact that we've had this legislation for long, so so long, and as we've heard, it has been so rarely used. To me, seems to factually and empirically argue against the fact that you know because it's been used once, we're necessarily we could, but we're necessarily going to get a decision that's going to be rest- more restrictive and problematic for our further practice, and that that is going to lead to a, a cavalcade of further cases which will further restrict the law. I just don't, I, I think that's possible, and I think it's worth discussing and worrying about, but I just don't think it's necessarily so, and I just wonder Certainly why... Certainly Bernard's point, though, that nothing ever gets wound back in these things. Well, it, that's in terms of the point, which is a good point, about legislating in the first place. So, of course, what we're talking about now is how courts are going about interpreting the legislation, and I do still think that if we find the legislation problematic, I don't think it's worth denying power and balance. I don't think it's worth trying to have a go at people who use legislation that exists for for them to use. This is a particularly egregious case. If any case ever should have been used with regard to the RDA, this one seems a pretty good candidate for it. So if we don't like the fact that it exists I, 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 there, we should get rid of it and argue against it. And none of us, I think, have done that. I, I've done it in print. It's terrible legislation. It should, have been, it, it should be repealed. It's awful legislation. Yeah, I mean, I, I see myself as... A, I've done that also. I mean, I mean, I see myself as an optimist. Before. Well, since, not yeah, before. Well, exactly. I'm, sure. I mean, I had to, I had to write. <laughs> I mean, I'm talking about before it all kind of blew up and then everybody started having this a is, This is the first high-profile sort of case on dealing with the RDA in a while. The, the, the most, I think the most notable previous case, I think there's, there's a couple of notable ones, but the, the, is, is the Friedrich Tobin one. And that seems to me to be a much more dubious case about, I mean, uh, undoubtedly what he said was extraordinarily offensive, but it seems to me um, uh, Holocaust denial, the, uh, uh, as Jim says, the, the consequences of, the, of, of first of all that case, and then when, when Tobin got shanghaied off a plane at Heathrow and put before the British courts because the Germans wanted to put him in jail for Holocaust denial, all that's done is lift that man's profile, lift the profile of his bloody website, and give him a chance to you know, further explicate his, his appalling views. This is an argument about tactics, and it's a valid argument, and I've heard lots of people in the Jewish community make it, but it still isn't really an argument that says the law should not be available for those who disagree with those tactics, and I've tried to explain the historical background as to why some people do. That's a separate I don't, I don't question. understand what you're saying. It's you're a saying, question of tactics, whether or not are, it's a are we wise arguing, decision to are we use arguing the law. first principles about the merits of the law or are you saying that any time there's a law, you can't attack it, you just you could just let people use it? So if the Howard government passes a law saying prisoners can't vote, you don't get to say that's bad legislation. You just say, well, look, it's the law. Everybody can use it. I don't think I even remotely are, said that. That is what you seem to be no, saying to me. No, I, I didn't really. Okay, so this is bad legislation. Do you agree or not? Um, I actually think it would be interesting to see, as I've already said, what the courts do with it and how, if they add an additional restriction on free speech, how they play that out using the legislation and how they interpret it. I'd like to see the courts do it because what I was going to say was I think there was a chance for an argument to take place, a much fairer argument, in fact, given, you know, the two people did manage to have lawyers. And and this was an argument that was also made in the case of Tobin, that the lawyer um, responded to this kind of argument that, oh, you know, it's completely legitimate. The only place to have this sort of public debate about restrictions on free speech is in the public sphere because there should be, um, you know, no laws that restrict it. This person said, well, we did just have the debate. We had a debate about whether or not this was 
Holocaust denial, whether or not it was vilifying Jews, whether or not it um, was uh, covered by the RDA, and whether or not it was found problematic by the RDA, we had it in court. And hey, I won. And to me, that seems like a pretty good place to have it. I no, mean, it's, it's, not, it's not the only place to have it, and maybe sometimes we don't want to take it that far. But it is not necessarily a bad place to have it. It is. It's a bad place to have it. Right. Well, we We've disagree. reached vigorous disagreement on that point.